we have been talking about Jesus is the answer. And I felt a little encouraged when I heard the wonderful song, Jesus, you are the center of it all. It just simply click in to what you have been doing. We began this last week, Sunday, talking about Jesus is the answer. And we emphasize, and I like to re-emphasize that, that we must be very careful that some of the things that we hold very dear and we actually promote and we actually defend and we actually contend for, they must become more than just a statement. They must become a reality. They must find expression in our lives. We need to experience them. So when we say that Jesus is the answer, this must become experiential. It is not of any benefit to you or to anyone to whom you have been speaking. If you were to tell them that Jesus is the answer, and then next half an hour, maybe half an hour, maybe next 15 seconds or so, those same people to whom you have been talking that Jesus is the answer, you begin to complain how hard things are, and you don't know what you will do if things continue as they are. You don't know what you're going to do, how you're going to solve this problem. You begin to complain that you have been going to this place looking for employment or looking for loan, and everybody has been turning you down. And you have just defeated what you have just said, notwithstanding that you believe it from a doctrinal point of view. And this is the very great danger that we face, that we can actually be promoting in our language certain truths, and when it comes to personally experiencing that, our confession and our declaration defeat what we believe we believe. So my point to you is we're making sure that when we say Jesus is the answer, that we will be able to be convincing people that this is not just simply a doctrine, this is not just simply a cliche, which it is not at all, but this is in reality who Jesus really is. He is the answer. And beloved, is there a time when we need to emphasize this? When the world needs to hear this, it is a time like now. Because according to the word of God, we have been warned by the Apostle Paul in Colossians chapter 2 and verses 8 and 9 that there is a philosophy that we got to be very careful about because Paul went on to say it spoils you. It is not according to God's wisdom. It's not according to Christ. Matter of fact, it says it is anti-Christ. And these philosophies, they have one agenda. And the agenda is to replace God with science and technology. And if we are not convinced that Jesus is the answer, when these folks bring the plausible, convincing argument, we can find ourselves bowing our heads in agreement. We can find ourselves even speaking after what you have spoken because they are so convincing. They are so sure of what they have said. They can find themselves denying what you have always believed to be true. That's why I give you an idea of what I'm talking about. When Elijah saved the prophets of Baal, he was not going to experiment. He told them point blank that time has come for Sudan. 
If God be God serving Israel, let us serve Israel. But let us put an end to this kind of argument right. So we have been talking about a little example. When Elijah faced the people, the prophets of Baal, he had no time for argument. He told them, let us prove who God really is. And the one who answered by fire, let it be known that he is God. That's the point we are talking about. Elijah did not get up there and begin to argue with the prophets of Baal and have a showdown and have a confrontation and things like that. He said, no time for argument. Let us prove who God really is. I believe that Jehovah is God and you believe that Baal is God. Well, let, let us put an end to the argument right now, you're saying. Let us see who is going to answer by fire. So Elijah had to believe that God was not going to let him down. In the midst of the argument, in the midst of the anti-God atmosphere, in the midst of the anti-God culture, he proved by demonstration that Jehovah was the answer. Another point I'm making here, when we say Jesus is the answer, we don't want to argue with anybody. We don't want to have any confrontation. We don't want to enter into any debate. All we want to do is to produce proof that when we say Jesus is the answer, Jesus comes forth and proves to the people that he is the answer. But who does that? Whether people believe or not, Jesus is Jesus. Whether the whole world begin to doubt him or not, he is still Jesus. Whether or not the whole world think that he's a monster, no, he is still Jesus. So the point I'm making is, the onus is on the people of God who believe that Jesus is the answer to demonstrate to the world in a godless world, in a world that is being spoiled and destroyed by philosophy and philosophical jargons. We must be able, without any argument, without any malice, without any envy, without trying to get any pound of flesh, we must be able to, de de to, to declare, declare that Jesus is the answer. And that is what the real matter is. And I hope to beloved that having heard this message today, that you are going to take stock of yourself and ask yourself, do I really believe what I believe I believe? Do I really believe what I believe I believe? Jesus is the answer. So we began this thing just last week, Sunday, and today is the second installment. And today, I'm going to ask the question, who is Jesus? And as we continue next week, Sunday, and the Sunday after that, and the Sunday after that, and the Sunday after that, we're going to ask ourselves, how does he qualify to be the answer? What are the proofs? What are the demonstrations that back up your contention that he's the answer? And if he's the answer, what legacy has he left to the people of God, the church? So this series, beloved, will take maybe about six or eight weeks or so, or even beyond that. And I hope that you're going to join me as we continue with this series, Jesus is the answer. So we ask today, who is Jesus? First of all, Jesus is the proof that God keeps his promises. In the book of Genesis chapter 3 and verses 15 and 16, God made a promise. And I want to read it to you. 
And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above the cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Listen well, very carefully. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heels. So here Jesus, here God the Father, is making a promise. And folks, you know that the God we serve keeps promises. But there's something I want to point out to you, lest you maybe sometimes don't pay attention to it. God came down in the garden after Adam and Eve had sinned against him. And so God is addressing three personalities. He addressed the woman. He addressed Adam. And he addressed the serpent for the impersonification of the devil or Satan. But you're going to observe that when God addressed Adam and Eve separately, he did not hold out to them an answer. He just told them what the judgment is upon them, what the curse is upon them, and what they are going to be suffering upon the face of the earth what are going to be the result of their disobedience. But when God addressed the serpent representing the devil, God was very clear to make it quite clear to the devil that there is an answer. He said there's going to be the seed of a woman. The woman will have a seed that are going to bruise your head. And we know for sure, beloved, from the book of Galatians chapter 3, and we'll come to that later on, and Galatians chapter 4, who that seed was. So God, way back in the garden of Eden, is making proclamation that there will be an answer to what the devil had done. There will be an answer to undo what Satan might have done. And the answer was the seed of the woman. I think that that is very noteworthy to underline in your Bible. So God, having made a promise, keeps his promises. In the book of Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, here we have God remembering what he spoke to the serpent way back there in the Garden of Eden. And Paul declares, when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. So here God is reminding the world that he is not one who makes promises and forgets them or makes promises in good intention. But when circumstances confront him, he finds it difficult or impossible. When the fullness of the time has come, God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law to redeem, in other words, to buy back. To rescue, to turn around, on, and then also to undo what the enemy had done. To end the enslavement upon humanity. And God did just that. And that answer, beloved, was not Cain or Abel. You went to find in Galatians chapter 4. That Paul declared when God made promise to Abraham, he did not use plurality. He did not say seeds out of many, but out of one seed. And you're going to observe 
Every time God made a promise to Abraham, and every time God was making reference to the seed of the woman, the singular was always used. So Paul is making it clear that that seed was not Isaac, that seed was not Jacob, that seed was not Isaiah, that seed was not Elijah. He did not leave it to speculation. He said that seed was Christ. So Jesus Christ was God's manifestation in the flesh, born from the womb of a woman to undo everything that Satan would have done way back in the Garden of Eden. That's why the Bible makes it quite clear that life, even from the dead, comes through one man. And that one man, his name is Jesus. So Jesus, from the beginning, and I want to emphasize that. I want to emphasize and re-emphasize that. From the beginning, it was the intention of God that the seed of that woman, his name would have been Jesus. And you know quite well, he was born of the virgin, and they call his name Jesus. Why? Because he's going to save the people from their sin. That was the purpose of God. Now, Jesus himself, in his public ministry upon the face of the earth, he actually made claims. And the claims that he made were not boastful claims. They were factual. For example, he said in John chapter 14 and verse 6, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man come to the Father but by me. He made it quite clear that he did not come down here to compete with anybody. He didn't come upon the face of the earth to hijack any principle or any organization. He came as the sole only answer that God had in his mind way back in the Garden of Eden. He said, I am. Not I will be or I was. He said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. The only way to God, he said, is me. The only real truth that cannot be contradicted is me. The only way to God is me. No man come to a father but by me. You may think that he is vain. You may think that he is boastful. No, beloved, he is testifying because he understood who he was. He understood why he came. In the book of John chapter 10, Verses 7 and 9, he said, I am the door. By me, by me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. Because why? I am the door, the door of the sheep. I am the door. Beloved, this is the only way we can come to God. There's only one way. And we need to understand that. And the people of God need to have no embarrassment, have no shame in proclaiming the fact that Jesus Christ and him alone is the Savior of the world. That Jesus Christ and he alone is the mediator between God and man. He went on to declare in John chapter 10 and verse 11, he said, I am the good shepherd. Who is the shepherd? A shepherd is one who had a double portfolio, one to tend to the sheep and to feed the sheep. In our words, Jesus Christ is saying in John chapter 10 and verse 11, say, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, that's for his friends. You know, in a world where we live today, there are so many different voices clamoring for attention. There are so many theories and philosophies out there that your heart really goes out to people. 
who are caught at a junction and don't know where to go. Because you ask yourself, who is really trustworthy? Who is real? Whom could I depend upon? Well, beloved, I understand your predicament. But remember, Jesus is saying, I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. The psalmist said, the Lord is my shepherd. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness. If you will turn your life over to Jesus Christ, you will have no need to be afraid that you will be led astray. You will have no need to be afraid that a blind person is leading you. Because the Lord said, I am the way. And he said, now I am the good shepherd. <laughs> and I want to recommend to you, beloved, that you put your hand in the hand of the shepherd. Allow him to lead you. The psalmist says, his rod and his staff, they comfort you. The rod is there to correct, to chastise. The staff is there to support, to help in time when you have need for help. <laughs> so there's nothing lacking, beloved. When you come to the good shepherd, and it's not me who I'm saying this, it is God, Jesus Christ himself says, I am, I am the good shepherd. He was very careful to identify and to qualify himself. Because I believe there might have been shepherds out there who really were hirelings. And he talked about that. Who didn't have the best interest of the sheep at heart. Who were exploiters. Who were speculators. But he said, I am the good shepherd. You cannot go wrong when you trust me. You cannot go wrong when you depend upon me. You cannot go wrong when you rely upon me. You cannot go wrong when you are led by me. You will never be led astray. Like the psalmist says, he leadeth me in paths of righteousness. He leads me by, beside the still waters. He leads me where the pastures are green. You cannot go wrong. And Jesus Christ is saying, I am. You want a shepherd? He said, I'm the answer. You want a good way? I am the way. You want a good door? He said, I am the door. Then he says, fourthly, I am the light of the world. As long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. John chapter 9 and verse 5. The Bible declares the whole world lies in darkness even until now. And beloved, the only person that can take you out of darkness into light, his name is Jesus Christ. The Bible declares he was told by the Father to bring light. Light is coming into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And Paul declared that when the Lord confronted him on the road to Damascus, he told him, I have chosen you to turn them from darkness into light, from the power of Satan unto God, that they might receive forgiveness of sin. Yes, beloved. That's why he said, I'm the light of the world. Sin is characterized by darkness. And Jesus is saying, I am the light. I am come to light those. And Isaiah, looking down the corridors of time, he saw something. I'm not quite sure if you understood what you were seeing. He said, arise and shine, for thy light is come. And the glory of the Lord is written upon you. Beloved, Jesus is the light of the world. He goes on and he said, I am the bread of life. John 6 and verse 48. I know in the world that there's one part of the world where there is famine. 
where actually people are making requests for basic food items. And while we in Trinidad might be spared that type of a tragedy, there are people in the world today who are starving. And today I want us to understand that Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I'm the one who can sustain you. I'm the one who can help you. I'm the one who can nourish you. I'm the one who can nurture you. You are in need of sustenance. He said, I am that one. I am the bread of life. Isaiah said, why do you spend your money for that which satisfies not? He said, come and buy bread. Come and buy. Come and buy. Come and buy without money. <laughs> That's a, a, a riddle. Come and buy. Buy me in exchange. You give me bread, I give you money. But he said, come and buy without money, without price. And Jesus fulfilled that. I am the bread of life. Let me move on. He also said, I am the living water. In John chapter 4 and verse 10, Jesus had a conversation with the woman at the well. And in the course of the conversation, Jesus said to her, if you had known who is talking to you, you would have asked of him, He'd have given you living water. And woman said, but I mean, the well is deep. I mean, what are you talking about? Jesus says, whoever drinks of the water that come from this well will thirst again. But whosoever drinks of the water I gave him will never thirst. But the water that I will give will be in him and will spring up into everlasting life. You're speaking of the life of regeneration. You're speaking of the Holy Spirit, whom those who believe on him will receive. I said, I'm the water of life. I'm the living water. Beloved, thirsty souls, it doesn't matter what you have upon the face of the earth. People are thirsty. And the only quenching element for mankind is Jesus Christ. I was talking to my family yesterday at the breakfast table, and I recounted an impact I had since I was in Bible school the 19, in 1960s. And I was telling them about a man who had come from Africa. In those days when you said you come from Africa, the missionary, everybody wanted him because Africa seemed to be so far away. And I remember there was a rally in the Queen's Hall in Porto, Spain, to honor this man and to have a report from him. And the, the place was just simply jam-packed. There was no vacant chairs in Queen's Hall. I remember the first time I heard the man, before he began to speak to the audience, he sang a song, and he had a tremendous tenor voice, and it was all my life long. I had panted for a drink from some cool spring that I hope would quench the burning of the thirst I felt within. Hallelujah! I have found him who my soul so long had craved. Jesus satisfies my longing through his blood. I now am saved. And all I can remember from then is all my life long I panted. And I just simply forgot because the thing was so impacting upon me. And folk remembered I eventually became the pastor of the San Juan Pentecostal Church. 
And the, the message that was preaching, I can't remember what the theme of the message was, I made reference to this scene in the Queen's Hall about this man who came back from Africa to the train, that and by the way, and he began to sing this song, and I can't remember it. And to my surprise, up jumped a wonderful, tremendous woman from the congregation, Sister Jo. She has died. And Sister Jo jumped up, and she sang that song, every single verse of that song, with such an anointing that was rarely heard. She sang that song, and my heart, I, I couldn't explain how I felt, what I felt to jump or to shout or to cry or to laugh. It was like heaven came down and flooded my soul. Yes, beloved, Jesus is that living water. And if you are thirsty out there, if you are thirsty for life, and you want something to satisfy. You want something to quench the burning of the thirst. Beloved, Jesus is not one of the answers. He is the answer to the thirst in your life. You may have everything. You will not even understand what it means to say, I can't afford that. You may have everything that life needs to be successful. But somehow in your heart, there's a burning, there's a vacuum, there's something that cries out for fulfillment, for quenching. Beloved, hear me. Jesus said, I am the answer to your thirst. I'm the answer to the burning on the inside of you. I am the answer. He's the living water. Jesus in John chapter 8 and verse 24, he was almost stoned for telling a woman, your sins are forgiven you. In John chapter 8 and verse 24, and they said, who can forgive sin? This man blaspheming. And he told the man, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, take up your bed. And he told the man, take up your bed. He said, he is the one upon the face of the earth to forgive sin. Beloved, there are some wonderful people in the world today. There are some wonderful Christian leaders in the world. And I respect them. But the only person upon the face of the earth even now to forgive sin is Jesus Christ. He is the only one who shed his blood, and by his blood, you're saved. By his blood, your sins are cleansed. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. He is the only one that can forgive sin. And last of all, Jesus showed disgust. When people didn't understand that he is the answer. Let me read to you a scenario of Luke's gospel, chapter 24 and verse 21. Let, listen to me carefully. But we trusted that had been he, we should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Now, it is the day that Jesus rose from the dead. He's walking with two people going to Emmaus, and they are talking and they are disconsolate. And what they are saying for verse 21 there, we have lost all hope. We hoped that this was the man. We thought that he was the answer. And the Lord was walking among them, and they did not know. But Jesus took offense, I should say. At their ignorance. And if you look at verse 25 of Luke 24, then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory. In other words, this focus said, We have lost all hope. 
We thought you have the answer. We are hoping that he's the one that's going to bring deliverance to Israel. What they were saying in essence is, the only hope we have that this was the answer is now shattered, is now no more. And the Lord called them fools. He took offense at that. How can you be walking with me and don't even know that I am the hope, I'm the answer? And he rebuked them and he, he upbraided them for their unbelief and they're not understanding the scripture that was spoken up about him. I hope that you will understand, beloved, that Jesus, the seed of the woman, God kept his word. He caused him to be born of a woman. The book of Galatians 4 and verse 4. And Jesus was very, very careful upon the earthly ministry to verify. And I'm sure I gave you eight of the quotations, but there are more in the Bible, that he is the answer. And I want to ask you, beloved, if you have not yet done so, if you're in a quandary, if you are at a junction, don't know where to turn, turn to Jesus. The song says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. May God really bless you. And if you need our help, beloved, we want to help you. Our number for the church is 6751679. From Monday to Friday between the old 8 o'clock, a half past 8 and 4 o'clock. You can also contact us by coming to the office right there in Sommel Avenue. You may need prayer. There's somebody that will pray with you. You may need counsel. I counsel every Wednesday. Free of charge, by the way. You haven't got to pay me a cent to be counseled. And we want to help you to find out that Jesus Christ is the answer. And I trust that this declaration today has helped you in some measure. Have maybe has answered some of your questions. Tomorrow, sorry, next Sunday, I continue Jesus is the answer. I'll be dealing with the corroboration of the claim of Jesus himself by the apostles, John, Peter, Paul, and even Luke himself. They actually back up everything that you've heard. Now, now I want to pray for you. Father, in the precious name of Jesus, I pray for everyone who have heard this message and if perchance there are those who are still bewildered and don't know where to turn, let one simple verse stick out in their mind where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to a father but by me. Let them turn their eyes and turn to him with all their heart. And allow him to become their shepherd so they can be led in paths of righteousness. Father, we thank you for those who need to be healed, that your healing power will flow into the heart and the life and the home of everyone now listening. I release your healing power and I rebuke every sickness and bondage. In the name of Jesus Christ, give us a wonderful week, we pray, to continue serving you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, and have a wonderful week. Remember, we are here to help you and to make life more meaningful to you. God bless you. Have a good day.